Hey everyone, we're live here. This is Mass of the Ages. I'm Cameron O'Hearn, the director of Mass of the Ages and Mass of the Ages Society, our nonprofit whose goal is to increase Latin masses and double Latin masses within a decade. So <laughs> we announced that goal, a big, mighty goal, uh, just a couple days ago. And questions have been pouring in. How do you expect to do that? Have you read Traditionis Custodis? Do you know that Pope Francis isn't sympathetic to the Latin mass? Those kinds of things. So are we being naive? Are we being overly optimistic? Well, we brought in some very intelligent men. Uh, guys, here. oh wait, let me bring you all in. All right, we, we brought some experts here to tell us if we're being naive, overly optimistic, we're gonna dig into canon law, traditionis custodis, what is the real uh, canonical situation of the Latin mass right now in the world? Um, I will introduce first Dan. So Dan, you can introduce yourself as well, but I just wanna say Dan is our director of operations with Mass of the Ages. Uh, he's helping us hire the right people, put processes in place, grow our nonprofit. He's also the one who first introduced me to the Latin mass way back when. So we, we go way back been going for 10 years now to the Latin Mass. So Dan, introduce yourself and then we'll go with uh, Dr. Cirilla and then Father Murray. Yeah, I'm, I'm Dan Driver. I'm the Director of Operations for Mass of the Ages. I'm originally from England, came over to America about 13 years ago and got to do some mission work with Cameron um, and take him to his first traditional Latin Mass. I now have five kids and uh, this topic is super important to me because I want my kids to know their faith and to be able to survive the storms of this world. Dr. Cirilla, who are you? <laughs> I'm Michael Cirilla. I'm a professor of systematic and dogmatic theology at the Franciscan University of Steubenville. And among other things, I focus in my research and writing on, uh, on matters in ecclesiology. That's theology of the church. Uh, and I've taught... Um, and written on uh, the liturgy, sacraments, uh, and other topics as well. I'm grateful to be here. Thanks for doing this, Cameron. And Dr. Cirilla is also in uh, episode three coming out, so we interviewed him for that. Exciting. Father Murray. Well, thank you, Cameron. Yes, my name is Father Gerald Murray. I am the pastor of Holy Family Church in New York City. I'm also a canon lawyer and uh, also a commentator on EWTN, Fox News, and various other outlets. Um, I'm a columnist at the Catholic Thing website and also at the Human Life Review. Um, so I do, uh, apart from parish work, I do try to analyze in light of my canon law training and my theological training as a priest, um, how we can confront difficulties in the life of the church. And if there was ever a difficulty in the life of us and the church, it's this controversy over the Latin mass. So I love the old mass. Um, I've said it for many years uh, privately uh, for many years and then occasionally publicly even still. Um, so I'm very happy to analyze what's going on and to defend uh, the proper understanding of church law against uh, popular misconceptions. That's great. And you were also inadvertently in episode one without you realizing it, right? <laughs> How is that? Tell me. Well, we, we use a clip from you from EWTN. I don't know if you ah, saw that part yet. But... Okay. <laughs> People I think know I you. That You're actually. already wow. famous yeah. in our circles. Well, You're going to have to pay him royalties now. <laughs> So uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. When we say Latin mass, we're going to use that term. It's, it's kind of a branding term. People know what you mean when you say it. What we really mean is the 1962 Missal. So Traditionis Custodis has to do with the, the 1962 Missal, the celebration of that. So we're going to use those terms interchangeably. So here's my first question. And this is to Father Murray, but Dr. Cirilla, feel free to bounce off of it if you want to. Pope Francis has made it clear that what he wants is for the Latin mass to eventually phase out entirely. Uh, so we can embrace the unique expression of the Roman rite, which is the Novus Ordo. So if he wanted to just abolish the Latin mass, 
How would he have to do it? And did Traditionis Custodis do that? Okay, so you have a couple of responses. Yes, it's accurate. The Pope, uh, in a letter accompanying Traditionis Custodis, said that people have to return to what we call the Novus Ordo, uh, and that uh, will take time in, in the Pope's conception. So basically, gradually, people have to be uh, taken away from the Latin Mass, which means the Latin Mass has to be taken away from them, in effect. Um, the Pope repeatedly calls it the unique expression of the Roman Rite, the new order of Mass. This is simply not true, uh, as a matter of fact, and that's not a matter of opinion, uh, because the Holy See endorses the Anglican Use Missal, and in, its, in the pre preface to that, uh, it states that this is an expression of the Roman Rite of the Mass, because indeed, the Book of Common Prayer is the basis of the Anglican Use Missal, and that was taken from the Roman Mass uh, as existed at the time of the Reformation. In addition, uh, the Holy See recognized the legitimacy of the Ambrosian Rite in Milan, uh, which is celebrated uh, all the time uh, up, to, up to our own present age. So there is not a simple answer that every single Roman Catholic in the Latin, who's a Latin Rite Catholic has only one mass of which they can avail themselves of. Not to mention that there's a Dominican rite as well. Yes. Uh, at other orders too. Yeah, there's so a Carthusian rite. Um, it's very true. There used to be a Franciscan rite. Um, but yeah, so the point being that on those matters, yes, the Pope is um, desirous of the extinction of the Latin mass. And he's also convinced that these other things are not true expressions of the Roman rite. And I would just say, in a matter of fact, uh, that's not correct. Now, the Pope has not abolished the old rite or the Latin mass, as we're saying here. Uh, we usually call it traditional Latin mass. That adds another word to it. But he hasn't abolished it, but he's restricted it. And um, in effect, he's signaled to the bishops of the world that they should follow his preference. And I'll just say, as a Catholic, a papal preferences in matters that are contingent, meaning they're not obligatory, uh, that's papal preference. It doesn't bind everyone else. You're not being disloyal to the Pope when you say to him, what you do not appreciate, I do appreciate, and therefore I wish to see the Latin Mass continue. So there's not a question of disloyalty, but there is a question of divergence. We're diverging mm -hmm. from the papal wish, um, and that's just part of being in the church. Um, we do not believe in the Pope as being having supreme power in all realms, including in our selection of preferences or things that we find valuable. So uh, that I just throw those out there to get the discussion going. Yeah, in terms of uh, you know, in, in terms of ecclesiology, the the papal office, popes have as their chief uh, task to receive preserve, defend, and pass on intact uh, the whole uh, traditions, uh, all of divine revelation, scripture, church teaching, including the liturgy. Uh, and when changes, uh, which include, I think, uh, deletions uh, occur, just like in canon law, Father, correct me if I'm wrong, but the principal norm is the good of souls. And Sacrosanctum Concilium in the Second Vatican Council also says no liturgical changes ought to be made that they're calling for, which were done after the council. But no liturgical changes should be made unless it's clearly for the for the good of souls. Uh, some of the viewers here may be aware of the ongoing liturgy debates. Uh, in particular, a recent round was between a series of uh, the authors of a series of articles in Church Life Journal, uh, Dr. Cavadini, Dr. Mary Healy, and Father Thomas Wynandy. Um, who, who argue uh, more substantively that perhaps it's not a matter of preference, but rather they argue, and I think incorrectly, that the ancient or the old, you know, right, the Latin mass that we're calling, uh, has a flawed ecclesiology. Uh, and they're not the first to say things like that. The, the reformers of the mass or the revisioners after the council made similar claims about defects in the traditional Right. And part of the problem is those defects they claim, such as uh, uh, the priest being seen as set apart from the people, those those alleged defects, I don't think they are defects. They also attach to the Eastern rites. The ancient Eastern rites have 
a very clear sense visually of priests going sometimes through an iconostasis into another room to consecrate the species and bring them out from the yeah, symbolism is from God then to the people. So there's a great mediatorial vivid image there that is sometimes not present in newer rites. But in any event, um, I think, Father, you're right. It's a matter of preference, but some will argue that there, it's more than preference. There are, there are these flaws, this flawed ecclesiology. Uh, and I think those are specious arguments. I've heard from bishops personally who I've talked to who, you know, read the intentions of the Pope. Like it's very clear what Pope Francis wants to happen. And they think to be in union with the Holy Father, which is the Catholic way, they have to, you know, carry out his wishes or his, his preferences. So, and they see it as a schismatic tendency to not be in union with the Pope's wishes. So what, what would you say to that? Um, it's not a schismatic tendency to disagree with the Pope on matters that are subject to discussion, because then the answer would be, well, I'm in agreement with Pope Benedict, who liberalized the celebration of the old mass. Um, therefore, which Pope am I being disloyal to if I, agree, you know, have an opinion, agree with one or not with the other? These are matters in which, you know, as you may recall, Pope Benedict uh, wrote a very pleading letter to the bishops of the world when he tried, when he recon attempted to reconcile the Society of St. Pius X because there was not broad support for what he did, which was lifting the excommunications among, for instance, the French hierarchy. So bishops argue all the time, look at the scriptures, the apostles had divergences of opinion. Uh, you know, remember uh, St. Paul and, and uh, John Mark split, you know, there, there were different or you have different modes of operation at, as things were going along. So I, you know, it's it's there's an exaggerated uh, reverential sense that to disagree with my father makes me a bad son. Hmm. But that's in the fairy tale world. Uh, the best thing that a, an obedient son is he obeys all legitimate orders. But if he thinks the father's making a mistake, he tells him that. Hmm. And in the case of, you know, for instance, the handling of sexual abuse cases, and I've said this many times over, the pope adopted a certain posture in, in, regarding a bishop in Chile. He was contradicted by local people who said, you got it wrong. And then the Pope sent an investigator and eventually was found to be wrong. So to, to tell the Pope something he may not want to hear, it, it, if, if you're doing it for reasonable good and with good information, it's, it's an act of charity and truth. No, that's absolutely right. Obedience is never to be just a blind obedience, especially if let's say there's a bishop, he feels pressure, like you said, from traditionis, I have to obey this. But in their conscience, what they're seeing, they're making a judgment and in their, in their conscience and based on what they're seeing, namely, at least in many places in the United States, there's a burgeoning renaissance, so to speak, of young, big Catholic families attending traditional, the traditional liturgy. Uh, people, and they, these are folks who, who assent to humanity Vitae. They assent to... Uh, uh, they're, they're not dissenters. Um, they may have some issues in certain respects, but none of them, as far as I know, in general, we don't have a crisis of, of heresy, of them denying a truth of faith. Uh, there may be some prudential disagreements on, on certain issues and non-definitive magisterial teachings that happen sometimes. But in general, you have this, this, this rising movement of faithful Catholics. And some of them have come into the church, a lot of them during COVID, directly into the traditional mass. Some of them have not attended the new mass. And this is not terribly uncommon. So you have a bishop who experiences this and they think in good conscience, can I just squat, quash this? Uh, I don't think I can. And I think fa that father's right. You, you know, obedience has, has limits um, and, and it's obedience in, in, in all legitimate, I think you said it, father, in all legitimate uh, directives. Um, but even if you took Traditionis as a, well, I guess I have a question for you, Father. If you took Traditionis as issuing general norms, or perhaps there's an accompanying document with it that maybe, see, I'm not a canonist, so here's my mm -hmm. opinion, but, but it, if you take it as issuing universal norms, right, uh, is there a recourse for a bishop to, you know, um, kind of canonical recourse? Yes, well, this, you know, uh, yeah, this was uh, the, the papal legislation in Traditionis Custodes it doesn't supersede all canon law. Canon law stays in place. 
So Canon 87 about the dispensing um, faculty of diocesan bishops remains in place. So Bishop Paparaki, for instance, dispensed uh, various aspects of TC. One of them was that the Latin mass could no longer be celebrated in parish churches. Um, and he dispensed that and it's completely legitimate because he is knowledgeable uh, of the, the local needs. And if the local needs could not be met with celebrating the mass outside of parish churches, then he can keep that. Uh, and that applies in other areas. Now the Holy See did issue uh, uh, a series of response to questions by the uh, Congregation for Sacraments of Divine Worship. Uh, the canonical status of those is not exactly clear as it was noted at the time, because uh, you know, generally, uh, when questions are submitted and the answer is given, it's the answer applies to the person who submits the question. Now, it has uh, exemplary uh, value for others who are similarly situated. Um, but in those, those answers, some of the things there, the bishop could likewise dispense from. Um, there was something I, I consider ridiculous saying that you could not advertise the existence of the Latin mass in the parish bulletin. Um, this is absurd, I think, on its own, but a bishop could say, no, in my diocese, we're going to allow that. Um, so it, let's just say that the canonical uh, arguments surrounding traditionalist custodians are complicated and require precise um, evaluation. But the, the broader point is that the papal judgment about the value of the Latin mass does not, is not binding on others. Uh, if he considers the Latin mass to be a source of trouble in the life of the church because he sees dissident factions uh, making use of it to separate people from the unity of the church, uh, I think that's an incorrect judgment. And I think other bishops, see if, I think bishops, many of them feel the same way nothing wrong with that. Uh, hmm. That's You can definitely disagree with a, a, a contingency, a contingent judgment, in other words, a, an assertion that the state of things is based on these set of facts can be contradicted when you say that set of facts is incomplete. Yeah. I mean, there, there's wisdom to that too, like the, the principle of subsidiarity, like that authority should be more localized because the bishop is closer to his flock or should be closer to the you know, those whom he governs in his diocese and Vatican Vatican II says, you know, the bishop is not a vicar of the Roman pontiff that he should just, you know, stand in for everything the Pope wants because the Pope has, he doesn't know his diocese. And it seems like it, what might be a problem in one diocese might not be a problem in a different one. Just to bring it down a big level for us plebs here. Um, a motu proprio, what, what what is it what does it mean where is it standing in authority because whenever something comes out of the vatican it's easy to just say oh it's the pope so it's ex cathedra and mm. some people might be confused with the weight of the authority yeah it's um it's not certainly not ex cathedra because that's reserved for the definition of the dogmatic uh, statements needing to be believed in order to be saved but it is a an act of the pope um uh, in other words, he is, uh, the Pope has issued uh, law, can canonical provisions uh, to meet a particular situation. Therefore, they are binding law, but again, they have to be interpreted in view of the rest of canon law. So uh, hmm. there, it, we, we don't believe in a, in a legal system in which everything that came prior to a, to a decree of the Pope has no value in the implementation of that new decree. No, the new decree has to be interpreted in light of the existing legal arrangements. Yeah, so motive proprios generally involve uh, something uh, in terms of a norm, promulgating a, a, a disciplinary norm. And sometimes they involve inserting new canons into the code. Um, I, I didn't happen with this latest motive proprio, if I'm not mistaken. We don't, we don't have a new canon inserted into the code, but we do have these disciplinary norms coming out. Um, but, it, you know, it's, it, it's funny because um, I think the claim is predicated on an, a, an opinion uh, that does, doesn't seem uh, well, well grounded. And that opinion is that there's some kind of widespread uh, dissent or rejection of the church. Yeah, happening. in Pope Francis's yeah. words, he felt 
compelled to intervene because, quote, you know, the or I'm not quoting yet, but the, the use of the 1962 missile is and then now I quote, too often characterized by a rejection of Vatican II. Right. And so apparently that position and related positions that the Holy Father has expressed, as well as Archbishop Roach, uh, who's involved in this process, were allegedly derived from a survey uh, sent out to all the world's bishops. But a mutual friend of ours, Diane Montagna, has done some very good uh, reporting on that. And, and there's a lot of questions we have. A lot of the survey results don't seem to have been considered. And in fact, it just it seems to be a lot of irregularities here that like a head scratcher. Another head scratcher I have is um, I think, Cameron, you actually put out this statistic recently in a video last week or, or this week uh, that uh, the Latin mass is said uh, and it's concentrated in regions of the United States and in France, but it's not everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it seems odd that there's this universal norms being issued. Father, what do you think? I mean, a universal norm issued that really hits on maybe just a small fraction of the faithful in the church. Uh, it seems very, very odd pastorally when there are bigger fires to put out, such as the, the transvestite movement, um, uh, gender, alleged gender reassignment, or all sorts of confusions uh, that seem much, if you triage things, they would seem to me to be much more important. Um, yeah, well, the issuing a general norm or you know universal law is not uh, uncommon, even when faced with a particular problem, only because that problem can exist and spread. Now, the issue, I would say, is um, the justification given for it by the Pope was based on a survey that he had commissioned of the world's bishops to find out the status of um, Sumorum Pontificum's implementation, which is the document that Pope Benedict had issued to allow the liberalization of the traditional Latin Mass. And Diane Montagna did do reporting based on sources that uh, allowed her to see the exact, some of the responses to those uh, survey questions. And there was nowhere near uh, any uh, level of, of universal or widespread concern that the people going to the Latin Mass as authorized by Pope Benedict were uh, rejecting the council, rejecting the church, uh, separatist movement. In fact, the finding would be, I think, the opposite. Since these people were attending Masses authorized by the Holy See, they made a conscious decision not to seek out the Saint so Society of St. Pius X Masses, um, therefore showing full adherence to the uh, canonical discipline of the church on the other hand, you can say this, the Pope, when presented recently within this calendar year by uh, two priests of the fraternity of St. Peter, uh, with a plea that they could be allowed to continue their work, the Pope granted it. It's, and likewise, yeah, it's bizarre. The habit of um, Fongambo uh, went to see the Pope and he, he was told, you, you're on the scene, you make judgments. So the... The fact that people are unhappy and dissatisfied with traditionis custodis is not a sign of malaise in the church. It's a sign of health and it's a sign of respect for the Pope, meaning we will respect you so much that we'll tell you the truth, even when you might not like to hear it, because that'll help you perhaps make a better judgment in the future. So on that point of respect, and you mentioned the word like when you disagree with your father, you tell him that like, the, the Holy Father is our father. We want to be faithful sons of the church. We're not here to just throw out, you know, laws, you know, new new norms that he's he's given us because he is the supreme pontiff. So, with that said, um, can can we just go like rapid fire through a list of questions about traditionis custodis, just for uh, primarily you, Father Murray and Cyrilla, if you have things to add on to that? Do you mind if we just go rapid fire through some things? So okay. there was, <laughs> if you can, I know there's, there's nuance, but so Samarum Pontificum 2007, like you said, liberalized Latin mass, you know, a faithful group, uh, who in any place who wanted the Latin mass should be granted access to it. But now through tradition as custodis, the Pope has put the power, so to speak, back in the hands of bishops to restrict or authorize the use of the 1962 missile. So now, currently, I'm curious, are all priests, every priest in the world, no matter their situation, 
required to obtain permission before celebrating the 62 missile? Uh, no, because uh, the priests who enjoy that faculty by virtue of being in one of the, what we used to call Ecclesia Day communities, in other words, the Fraternity of St. Peter and the Institute of Christ the King, uh, their uh, authorization comes through their constitution. So they don't, uh, traditional disorders did not touch those uh, permissions. Now, priests who are uh, otherwise situated, such as myself or diocesan priests, Yes, we do need the permission of the bishop to celebrate uh, legitimately or canonically properly uh, the traditional Latin mass, uh, all things being equal, you know, meaning if, if, it's, if you're accessible, the bishop, you can reach the bishop, you can, you know, make the petition, mm. et cetera. Uh, let's say, for instance, you have a fraternity priest coming to celebrate a wedding in your parish and the car breaks down and you can't get there and the bride shows up and you're five minutes before mass, go right ahead and say that mass, you know, you're not going to deprive people on that basis. So that's a quick answer. Yet they do need permission. But part of the canonical problem is uh, not everyone's going to be familiar with all the arrangements in every diocese where they're traveling. Um, hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, it's more paperwork. Um, and, you know, it, it does raise complications. May I ask a follow-up question, Father? Um, sure. If they need permission, a diocesan priest like yourself, to say the old mass publicly or, or, or also even privately? Well, traditional because that is, says both, you know, okay. it's any okay. celebration, it's sad to say, because, um, you know, if you, let's say you had a sympathetic bishop and you're a retired priest, you want to say the old mass in your retirement place, um, he might, he might, you know, he'll grant it, but let's say an unsympathetic bishop might say no, and then the priest will wait a minute. I've been doing this, you know, I'm 85 years old. I've been doing this since I retired when I was 75 and all the rest. Now you're telling me no. So, you know, then you then you can live, you can say, well, let me have a canonical recourse against that decree, and it gets complicated. Yeah. So Traditionus Custodis mentions priests ordained after Traditionus Custodis need permission and permission from the Vatican. Um, no, I'll correct cool. you on that. The traditional episode said that the bishop needs to inform the Vatican. And then okay. when the Latin version of that came out, because traditional is the, it, this is, again, part of the problem nowadays. Latin is no longer the official language of the Roman Curia. So traditionalist came out, it was in Italian. So the Italian was viewed as the uh, fonts at the Rigo, you know, the original document. But the Latin version came out a few months later and it changed it from uh, informing the Holy See to getting the permission. And that's a canonically irregular. A translation is not the forum to change a law. Hmm. But they did it. And then my information based on the things I've heard is that when bishops do write in, the Vatican denies the permission almost uniform, uniformly that young priests are not allowed. This, I think, is an injustice because what is the reason why a diocesan bishop would be required to ask permission? Uh, it's because Theoretically, in law, it would be so that make sure that the permission is granted in a proper way to a qualified candidate, not so that you can always say no. Right. You and the bishop would no, be the one who knows, just, right? Get rid of just change the law to say no permission is, is will be granted. Therefore, no requests right. are required. So that's game playing, in my opinion. And it's not a good game because why what if a priest is, uh, you know, ordained on you know the 25th of June, 2022, he can't say the mass, uh, but priests who were ordained three years earlier, who may be less fluent in Latin, they suddenly, you know, they're allowed to. It doesn't make sense to me. What's the canonical situation in dioceses where the bishops haven't said anything yet? So you're a priest in a diocese and your bishop hasn't made any statement about how he's restricting it or how he's responding to it. What, what, what do priests do when they're in limbo? Can they learn the... 62 well, missile. You know, the the presumption is that if a bishop is continuing to study how he's going to implement traditionis custodis in his diocese, and if he has not therefore issued any regulations uh, affecting, you know, existing uh, arrangements, then the existing arrangements continue. That would mm -hmm. be the legal presumption. Um, now, there was, you know, the question of the younger priests uh, that, that was never previously legislated by a diocesan bishop because that question never existed. Now, he could hmm. deny them on his own if he had his own particular law, but that would depend. So things that are new in the law, um, 
you know, this is where a canonical gray area, the bishop should uh, make provision. On the other hand, he may not feel that he has enough information or uh, pastoral sensitivity may demand that this be introduced in a way that he's not ready to do yet. Um, these, these are these are canonical issues. Um, Traditionist Custodis, in our conversations with other canon lawyers, they pointed out that it doesn't mention a timeline. So it says, you know, they should do this or they should seek this permission. Or Does that mean that can they legally wait a year or two like before they ask permission? For example, you know, priests who already celebrate according to the 1962 Missal should request from the bishop the authorization to continue to enjoy this faculty. Is right. that finding loopholes where there aren't any? Well, you know, the, the time limits are um, not written into the law. And, uh, in this case, they're not written in the law, but except as regards with new, newly ordained priests, then we have a definite date upon which you have to act uh, based. Uh, but, you know, if a bishop says, um, I'm still weighing in my mind how I'm going to implement this and make provision, um, you know, he, that's legitimate. If the Holy See tolerates something, that's another question. You, you know, if the Holy See sent a reply or sent a letter to the world's bishops uh, a year after Traditionis Casoda says, please inform us if you have not yet made the arrangements that are uh, discussed in Traditionis Custodes, uh, because the Pope uh, would like to know what reasons you have enacted, that kind of thing. But that hasn't happened as far as we know. And then uh, my last rapid fire question is on Article 3, Part 6, which says the bishops should take care not to authorize the establishment of new groups. So this is where the rubber meets the road. You know, people hear Mass of the Ages wants to increase Latin masses. It's like, you probably haven't read TC because uh, you're stopped dead in your tracks. There can be no new groups. So what does that mean canonically, new groups? Well, uh, I'm familiar with the provision where you're not supposed to establish parishes um, for Latin mass uh, purposes. Um, now, establishing new groups is a vague thing because um, it's not the, the bishop doesn't control the activity of the laity such that they can not form their own groups. Hmm. Um, so let's say you had a group of lay people who you know wanted to have the latin mass in their parish and they went in the past said, i'm sorry the bishop authorized it in parish xyz which is 10 miles away then those people could say well guess what we're going to start becoming parishioners at parish xyz and we're going to travel the bishop doesn't have to authorize them to do that because they're into you know they're faithful christians who are seeking to have spiritual nourishment so um I think the problem with TC is to view people go to Latin Mass as somehow forming groups that are apart from the rest of the faithful and therefore have to be treated in such a way. And the way I look at it is, no, individual members of the church, faithful people uh, who like the Latin Mass will seek it out. But that doesn't mean they don't go to the new Mass other times or that people go to the Latin Mass might like to go to the new Mass if it's more convenient. In other words, it's, it's not... It's not equivalent, let's say, a group of Hungarian-speaking Eastern Rite Catholics who, you know, are going to go to a Hungarian Eastern Rite parish, and therefore you got to provide for them. You know, uh, yeah. this in is fact, in, 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 that's so right in, in Steubenville. But I know we're not unique. I know it because I have friends and family all over the place, and they have this situation repeated all over the place. We have both at our university and at the local parish we go to the, the new mass and the traditional Latin mass. We have both. Also at the university, we have a Byzantine club. We have Byzantine liturgy, a St. John Chrysostom. We have a Maronite liturgy, okay, on a regular basis uh, throughout the semester, every semester for years now. And, and actually, there's a really nice coexistence, I didn't say coexistence because a lot of us go to both. Uh, a lot of us go, uh, uh, I'd see, even say perhaps most go to both. So, um, you know, the situation of kind of enclaves that are like para-ecclesial or like parallel ecclesial communities like you were saying father I, I'm ju we're just not seeing that um terribly much now maybe i'm just not looking or i don't know the right people uh but uh anecdotal evidence of course we teach students from all over the country and all over the world uh, we say about about a third of our students we've been taking informal surveys in class some of us uh, not just myself um 
about a third of the students really enjoy a the ancient liturgies, east or west. Um, and it's and again, I say enjoy, but they they benefit. They derive a lot of fruit from it, and a lot of students derive a lot of fruit and faculty from the new mass too. So so there's a real um, the situation is is we we just don't think a lot of us don't think we're seeing the actual situation being reflected as we've said in the in the in the survey alleged survey results and then in the decisions that have been made as a result of those survey results so we've we've you know just scratched the surface surface on traditionist custodis i think it's clear that the situation is we're in a difficult situation the latin mass has been restricted um, we're also in a confusing situation. Not everything is clear canonically. One thing that Mass of the Ages is hanging our hat on is what bishops have been doing worldwide responding to Traditionist Custodis. So if you go to this website I keep mentioning, traditionistcustodis.info, it catalogs the public responses of bishops. So I'm, I've clicked on United States and we have 100 99 dioceses, nine, 99, so one less than 100, have responded, and 70% of them have not suppressed any Latin masses. So you can click on these and find out what, what they've said, their statements. But you notice that like most bishops are positive or neutral towards the Latin mass. And the other thing we've, we've noticed uh, by looking at each of these individual situations is that 10 bishops so far that we've counted, there, there certainly could be more, have specifically invoked Canon 87. So, Father Murray, you mentioned Canon 87 earlier. Why is that an important canon? It's an important canon because it recognizes that the diocesan bishop has the right to dispense from universal ecclesiastical laws uh, for the good of the faithful. Uh, now, the Holy See can restrict that if they uh, make a statement saying that this new legislation is not subject to, uh, you know, canonical provisions of Canon 87. Um, but they didn't do that in Traditionis Custodis. Mm -hmm. And that's proper because one of the uh, things about the re renewed, the Restore Code of Canon Law, the 1983 Code, was to recognize uh, the legitimacy of decentralization uh, when appropriate in the life of the church, and certainly in making rulings about the place of celebrating an authorized mass, for the Holy See to be uh, universally, uh, with one rule, uh, establishing the most appropriate arrangements is unthinkable, uh, because the, the, the variety of situations throughout the world is such that you, you can't anticipate all the possibilities uh, mm -hmm by one specific law. So therefore the law leaves it up to the local legislator where that uh, restriction of Canon 87 is not invoked, meaning the bishop has the right to dispense. And that's very good. Uh, there's nothing anti-papal about that. Um, it's, uh, you know, the Code of Canon Law is promulgated by Pope John Paul II. Therefore, <laughs> yeah. so to abide by the Code of Canon Law is to abide by the papal wish. And again, what one pope does subsequent to that doesn't involve the erasure of everything came before it. No, what comes new has to be integrated into the existing legal arrangements. And so, maybe help me understand this. I mean, it, it seems that the Pope somewhat recognizes that even in Traditionis Custodis in Article 2, when he says that the bishop is the moderator, promoter, guardian of the whole liturgical life and has exclusive competence um, he does then go on to say, according to the guidelines of the Apostolic See, but doesn't really like set like with force, like you have to like follow it to this degree. And then he goes on to say that, you know, there are supposed to be locations for the traditional Latin mass um, for people to to be able to celebrate it um, and on which days um, and that there should be a competent priest to uh, like carry that out um, both pastorally and also rubrically. So it does seem that the Pope even kind of recognizes that the Bishop is um, the, the, the key here. 
Uh, a quick answer to that is, of course, because the Pope recognizes the legitimacy of the arrangements that he himself enjoyed when he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires. <laughs> you don't have to call Rome every day to get all your decisions confirmed. You are according <laughs> to the law, and therefore you are operating legitimately. Sure. So that recognition is there. But, Dan, there's also a, a tension because, in a sense, there's a over, it seems to me, in my judgment, an overreach of centralization down to some, I'd say this, try to be respectful, but minutiae, um, whether you can publish something in a parish bulletin seems way beyond the pale to me and, and kind of an over, like a radical overreach. So uh, I'm not sure how to square the two, but I do get this sense, um, and this is very concerning, uh, that, that somehow there's the perception that um, the, the lex credendi, the law of faith, is somehow, you know, the faith of believers is somehow going to be harmed uh, by, a, by a liturgy other than the Novus Ordo, at least in the Roman Rite. And I think, and that's in great tension. We mentioned this before, too, uh, several of you, Father and, and, and Cameron, that, you know, there's prior, you know, the prior motu proprio summorum pontificum um, has to be taken into account. And there, the the Holy Father, Benedict, said that, that you know, what's been nourishing the faith of uh, saints and, and the faithful for ages can't all of a sudden be considered harmful. Um, I think, you know, pastorally, and of course, I'm not a pastor, so Father, you can just completely negate this if, if I'm off base here. But it seems to me, if you if you have a problem of, of dissent or schism, if you think you're perceiving that, even if that's not the case, but somebody thinks they're Pope thinks they're perceiving that. Is the way to do that to suppress a liturgy? I'm not sure there's precedent for that historically. Um, there have been suppressions of liturgies, yes, um, of Trent. But there, the suppression was novel liturgies, liturgies less than 200 years old, not ancient liturgies. So the whole thing, the, the whole thing just seems off to me, um, mm. uh, especially since a lot of us see the great riches uh, and, and more than just a matter of, of, uh, of taste but rather kind of um, amazing um, riches that feed the faith in, in the ancient rites, not just Roman, but also Eastern. So it just, the whole thing just seems off. Well, I'll, I'll say what lies in the background of this from the, the side of those who are not in favor of the old mass is they, they basically say the new mass expresses the will of the Second Vatican Council to have a renewal of the liturgy so that it would be more understandable, more accessible, and would uh, you know bring people closer to God by making them better participants. Um, the, the things to note about that, of course, is the council did not rewrite the mass. That was rewritten after the council had closed, and it was re rewritten by a committee approved by Paul the Sixth. So it's completely legitimate to say um, I'm not disobeying the council if I'm objecting to what the committee and Pope Paul the Sixth decided. Uh, needed to be done because you could, you know, in the Council of Dogmas, say, for instance, a Latin language not to be suppressed. Well, I, I was ordained in 1984. There was one Novus Ordo Latin Mass celebrating the Archdiocese of New York in 1984 on a Sunday afternoon at a parish near the, uh, the Holland Tunnel. In other words, Latin was effectively suppressed in all parishes uh, as, this, as the language of worship, with the exception of some chants. Um, now, back to the other point I'll make to respond to that is that um, people who don't like uh, people go to Latin Mass because they say it's more mystical and all try to claim, well, the new Mass is just as much reverential mystical. And I say the new Mass all the time and I try to make it such. But I think it's just a plain observable fact that the silent canon is more mystical than the spoken canon. Uh, it's just it's, it's everybody who goes to the old Mass for the first time. That's one of the things they say. Yeah, priest starts speaking in a low voice, and then you hear the bells. Mm. Uh, that's a perfect example where you can say, "Look, if the goal was to make the mass more accessible, from the point of view of mysticism, people are not happy because they liked the idea that this was a mystical experience." And feeding into that is also the priest ad orientem. Uh, it, it, there's a sense of he's chosen and is doing something very special with God. Mm. That's right. Now, our end is not forbidden in the new mass. No, no, that's right. That's and right. that's, that's yeah, something that's that Cardinal Sarah brought up. And, you know, we say our Orient mass at my parish all the time. Right. Yeah. Uh, because precisely it's, it's, 
the back of the priest is not the reference point. It's where's the priest <laughs> looking at the, the rest great. of the people. It's that nice yeah. vestment he's wearing. Yeah, and then the the iconostasis in the Eastern Rites functions in a similar fashion. That's right. Because we turn to from preaching the word to now bringing the word made flesh on down to the altar. Mm -hmm. And that's the business of the mm -hmm. altar Christus uh, and the prayer. And then when he's ready, he turns to people and say, behold, the Lamb of God. So th these kind of things, these are worth debating new mass, old mass, because they're all concerned with salvation. No, that's right. That's right. And that and that's the key. Again, I don't think we can emphasize that enough, that it, the changes have to be for the good of souls. Uh, so that's that's a principle to keep to keep front and center. So we just have a few minutes left. So I'll just ask one more question and then we'll let both of you go. And then, Dan, you and I can just gather our thoughts for the end. Like at three thirty, we'll let you guys go. And then Dan and I will just uh, conclude with s some of our closing thoughts. So the, the last question is. And then either of you can go first, but it's the title of this video, uh, basically. Do you think Latin masses will grow or decline? And then what would cause them to grow? Well, um, the, the reaction to Tradiciones Custodes universally has not been enthusiastic among the hierarchy. So I don't think there's going to be a decline in the number of masses on the scale of, let's say, losing 50 to 75 percent of them celebrated throughout the world. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, now, if the Pope remains in office for 10 more years, he might do further actions to restrict the Latin mass in view of what he said in his letter accompanying TC, uh, that people should go back to the, the old mass. And he, I could, he could easily say, you know, my wishes expressed in this reflect were not reflected in the actions of the bishop. So therefore, I have to take the extraordinary step of promoting the new mass in this way. I don't think he's going to do that. I hope not. Um, but it's a possibility. But if things are left on their own, <laughs> good things grow when they're no nourished by faith and love. Mm. And I think that's what's going to happen. I couldn't say it better. I, I think that's right. Um People who are, it's really the movement of God and his grace and the Holy Spirit. Uh, people who are converted, um, they seek uh, to worship reverentially our Lord. The old Latin mass provides that beautifully uh, when done well. And it often is, mostly is done well. And, um, and so uh, all of the things being equal, I think that's right. Naturally, uh, good things will flourish, right? That being said, we can't prognosticate. Who knows what will happen? The Pope could could try to suppress it altogether. Um, there are all sorts of trials that we could be going through. Uh, the last few years are uh, really um, wake up calls to that. So yeah, there could be there could be a mass. Who know, who knows? It could be a mass suppression, right? But uh, but we'll pray and 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 see and and hope. But but I wanted to to, to thank you, Cameron and Dan, for your great work, and also you, Father. Uh, we love watching you on EWTN with Robert Royal and uh, Raymond Arroyo. Thank you for your clarity, your honesty, and your fidelity. Yeah. Well, thank you very kindly. And let's thank Mother Angelica for yeah. starting that <laughs> <laughs> under the inspiration, I'm sure, of the Holy Spirit. That's right. Thank you both for coming on. We're really grateful for your time, carving out some time for us. Um, is there anything you'd like to promote before you jump off? Well, some of the things I say about the Latin Mass can be found in my book, Calming the Storm, published by the Mayus Road Publishing of Dr. Scott Hahn. I also gave an interview to the Remnant newspaper on Tradiciones Custodes, and that uh, appeared. Uh, Diane Montagna was the interviewer. And if you just Google my name at the Remnant, you will find that uh, a long, long interview in which we deal with a lot of questions that came up today. Father Murray needs his hundredth five-star rating. So it's uh, <laughs> at 99 right now. These are all the bishops in America who are in the green dioceses. 99 ratings. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Dr. Cirilla, what, what would I, you like to promote? I have a, I have a book on, on Aquinas' theology of the Episcopacy. So we're talking a lot about bishops here. And I get into the to the theological angle of the episcopacy as a mystery of faith. It's founded by Christ and the roles and duties of bishops. And they, a lot of this overlaps what we're talking to that, about today. What's it's it called? Book. It's called The Ideal Bishop. Uh, 
Thomas Aquinas's theology of the Episcopacy. Mm. Uh, it's an academic book, so it's not it's it's not uh, easy reading. It's like thick black mm. Russian bread. Is that it? <laughs> That's it. Yes. All right. Yeah. All right. Go buy the books. Th <laughs> thank you. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, Dan, we'll, we'll share our thoughts uh, right now. Thank right, you guys. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Peace. Thank you. God bless. All right. So I, I'm going to read uh, Canon 87 because this is, we mentioned it a few times, but I think people just need to hear how strong this law, which still is in place, which I'm sure Pope Francis realizes is still in place, which 10 bishops have invoked in America, as far as we know. Um, Canon 87, a diocesan bishop, whenever he judges that it contributes to their spiritual good, is able to dispense the faithful from universal and particular disciplinary laws issued for his territory or his subjects by the supreme authority of the church. So Traditionis Custodis has restrictions. Sometimes the restrictions feel like they're overreaching. Um, sometimes we might disagree with them, but the battleground for us, we really look at the diocesan bishops and, okay, what are the bishops doing now? And we're optimistic because most, most of them are positive or neutral to the Latin mass. And that's even when considering that the Latin mass movement right now does not have a good, you know, face, it doesn't have a good brand. It doesn't, people's perception of the Latin mass isn't usually a positive thing. So what we're doing at mass of the ages is going to, the short term is going to make Latin masses easier than ever to learn and to start, you know, start at your parish for, for mm -hmm. these dioceses where the bishops have allowed it. It's going to make it easier than ever. That's the short term. We're developing a bunch of resources for that. But the long term is that the more content and beauty and story that we can put out there that puts a new face on the traditional Latin mass movement, the easier it is for these bishops to protect it in their dioceses, to say, how could I take this mass away, which is, uh, you know, a solid foundation for a widow or solace for an orphan, you know, that strengthens the faith of these, these Catholics. So I'm optimistic about the future, but how do you feel, Dan? Go I mean, we've, we've talked through traditions, traditionis custodis a lot internally as a team, just like praying through it and considering our mission. So what does the future look like for you? There are things that I'm I'm hopeful for and things that I'm concerned about. I mean, one of the things we didn't really get time to, I would have loved to have hear, heard their uh, opinion on this, but um, we, we briefly touched on the difference between um, what happened at Vatican II and then the liturgy that came after it. Um, in Traditionis Custodis, Pope Francis equates the two things as being like intimately yeah. wed. He says... Um, in order to promote the concord and unity of the church with paternal solicitude towards those who any region adhere to the liturgical forms antecedent to the reform willed by the Vatican Council too. Right. Like, yeah. I, I, my, my question is, how, how can we say that that is the reform that was willed by the Second Vatican Council? I mean, if, yeah, we have the these 2,000 bishops. Yeah. yeah, I mean, these we have these 2,000 plus bishops that sign off on Sacrosanctum Concilium, right? That explicitly say, like, here, here's the principles and guidelines that you, you're you supposed to follow. Um, and then it just wasn't followed. So how can we say that that's what the council willed? You have the concilium that overlaps the council partially, but it's not any of really any of the members that signed off on the, on the documents um, or many of the members that signed off on the document. So I just don't understand how we can. So uh, here's an interesting thing that uh, I've noticed in Pope Francis is so traditionis custodis does seem to make that logical error that the new mass was willed by the second Vatican council in the sense that there was like patterned on sacred Sanctum concilium, yeah. which is obviously false. If you just look at the missile itself and look how it's celebrated. Yeah. But what's interesting is, so 
his his follow up document does he daria does he <laughs> you know what it's called you guys know <laughs> the thing you know the thing Desi Dario Desideravi. So he says, um, I'll put it on the screen here. He doesn't say it as clearly and directly as he did in TC. He actually says, and at the same time, not accept the liturgical reform born yeah. out of St. Yes. Dr. Concilium. So he's kind of walking it back a little bit, which is interesting. Well, it's like, we can agree that Sacra Santa Concilium was the catalyst for the liturgical reform. Um, sure. <laughs> right. And in his follow-up letter, he also says, to doubt the council is to doubt the intentions of those very fathers who exercised their collegial power in a solemn manner, cum petro et sub petro, in yeah. ecumenical council. And in the final analysis, to doubt the Holy Spirit himself who guides the church, which is really to say that the concilium that constructed the liturgy like is thrown into question because of this because it isn't like the liturgical reform indicted by this statement of pope francis it i i don't understand what we're supposed to do or what we're supposed to think yeah there's just a lot of confusion and it, it shows that the, yes the church can make some mistakes yeah like it's it's made prudential mistakes in history we can underline those you know there's there's many of them uh, pope francis can make logical errors it doesn't undermine the church and uh right. we're set we're, <laughs> we're sounding a little uh r ratty tratty maddie tratty right now but uh we, oh am we, i oops <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> i'm not me no, you're, you're just british i just want to know the answers i just want clarity <laughs> I, know, I know like let's talk about you. them let's not just like brush them aside and be like let's pretend that was never said like it should people should be aware of it and should yeah. be able to discuss it in a healthy way yeah, so I, I hope it's clear to people that we, like the future of the Latin mass movement is not found by trying to disobey openly legitimate commands of the Holy Father. I think most people would agree with that. So we have to buckle down and suffer a little bit. Buckle Maybe down for, and buckle up. <laughs> yeah, both. Put your buckles on. Um, and maybe maybe it will get worse for a time, but I'm I'm really optimistic because the, you know, at the in the end, um, and I think very soon. I can't imagine. Yeah, maybe the next pope will be you know more restrictive, but the the movement is so strong, and it's it's not because people have great ideas. It's because the Holy Spirit is waking people up. Like I didn't know Latin Mass existed, and you introduced me to it. And I, I was awakened to it. And this yeah. happens all the time. You hear about it all the time in our comments feed. Like, I just discovered this. Amazing. It's the Holy Spirit moving in people's hearts. So I believe God is behind this movement. And the change is not going to happen overnight. But it, it will happen. I believe it will happen. Um, there's, I want to I leave people with this uh, scripture verse, which is about Abraham. Uh, he's told at age 90 that he's going to be father to many. And he's like, how will this be? And he finds out his you know, wife is infertile. So, you know, Hagar comes in and you know the story. Um, but eventually Abraham trusts that even though I'm old and my wife is infertile, God can do anything. And this is what it says in Romans four. And I just want you to just, I know you're worried about the future, you're concerned. It's mm -hmm. it. We're we're suffering right now, but just consider what Scripture wants to say to you. And this is what it says in Romans four. To those of us, you know, those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of us all, as it as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told. So shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which, is, which was as good as dead, because he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. 
No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Hmm. I am convinced of that, by the way, Cameron, just in case I didn't answer your question earlier. I think he, yeah. he, is, he is hopeful, um, but we do have to work and we have to yep. pray and we have to um, do what we can to support uh, the movement. So yeah, because God doesn't. God uses people. <laughs> he uses us to accomplish His purposes. That's how He laid it out. So, like at Mass the Ages, we're striving to increase Latin masses. Like we really think we can double Latin masses in a decade. And um, yes, it relies on God and the the bishops and the church hierarchy and decisions that make that that are made but currently as it stands the bishops have the power so we're gonna we're gonna push forward and uh come rain or shine we're gonna strive to increase latin masses so with that said um please go to latinmass.com slash give consider becoming a uh, founding donor of what we're doing we have some perks we'd love to give you for those who uh, decide to give monthly um and thank you ahead of time for your support. You guys have been incredibly generous. Dan, any last words? God bless. All right. Peace. Thank you all for listening. I'll see you in the comments.